All right, guys. So it's 4:30. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not there. Because I don't know if some special mechanism, but yeah. All right. So let's start. And yeah. Hi, everyone. And I is being in Vienna. My that's my second time, and I'm really thrilled that that I'm here for very first time in Google Camp in Vienna. So yeah. Thanks for choosing my session and being here. And it's a great uh, thing you're here. Right, so I'll be talking about implementing Scrum for a scale group of projects. But uh, before that, actually, <laughs> I forgot to add a slide for myself. Um, just I'm going to do some quick introduction. My name is Bisek Simeon. I'm from Bulgaria and I'm working for FFW. Actually, FFW stands for the Great French from Work which actually it's uh, like the biggest digital agency in the world. This is like the marketing uh, logo that we have. So um, yeah, I'm dealing with Drupal projects since uh, 2002 or one. Yeah, something like that. Four years, three and a half years, let's say. And I really like uh, working uh, for the web development. Before that, I was like uh, the like the standard project manager dealing with uh, waterfall projects and we I was working for a telecom company actually that was the biggest telecom company in Bulgaria Mobiltel which was bought by Deutsche uh, that by Austria Telecom so we had actually some connection with Vienna and we like we were really focused in planning every simple every single bit and every single piece and yeah, I, I didn't like the, this approach. Before that, I was working for another IT company, again, trying to implement the waterfall approach. And actually, when I stepped into the web development, uh, let's say, field, I discovered uh, Scrum and Agile. And I felt in love, obviously, because it is really cool. And it is working. And it is working uh, better than the waterfall. This is my personal opinion. I mean, I'm not going to uh, try to convert everyone in if the other person is thinking something else. So that's about me. So let's talk about you, actually, why you choose this session, what you want to learn. And so please feel free. I mean, uh, maybe I can draw at the beginning some <coughs> topics. Anyone? How to manage big scrum team. More than 15. 15. Okay. Manage, pick, approximately 15 people. Yeah, can one team uh, work on the multiple? Sorry, I didn't hear uh, Scrum and what's cross, cross functional thing when you have different roles as designer and uh, Scrum designer. Yeah. So, you're more or less the question is um, how different roles are working together in a Scrum team. So let's see, maybe we want to do some work for the uh, Scrum. Uh, how, how do we work for the Scrum? How do we different uh, teams. So how, how to manage that uh, thing when you work on more projects and one project needs only two or three developers and the other one needs more developers. So you don't have consistent teams. But in one project you have a team with three people, in another project you have a team with four or five people or two teams or something like that. And you're the scrum master for both projects. Yeah. But the people 
people are different. Oh no, they're yeah. shared. Maybe they, they can they can share. It's basically the, the second question. It's, it's the, yeah, it's close. Something to see. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Emergency. All right. Yeah. I'm writing this one. Good. So uh, let's quickly go uh, to the slides that I had prepared. Hopefully, at the end, uh, I'm quite sure I won't be uh, answering to some of the questions with the slides, but we can definitely get better. Uh, so, yes, what this session is aiming for? Um, actually, yeah, the, that's why I asked uh, those questions at the beginning, more or less to identify uh, what are your problems. And actually, based on the question, I think, on the questions, I think that yeah, we just, you're having the same trials as I do. So, uh, I won't be spending a lot of time discussing uh, what actually the Scrum is and how it works. Uh, so that's the first topic. So good understanding of the Scrum approach and uh, its application to a large Drupal project. Maybe you are going to be able to answer to some of the questions. And uh, yeah, I'm going to try to yeah, explain, actually not, not explain, but talk about some of the tips that at least I have found out and they are working for me. So maybe we can share together. So software projects in Scrum. And actually, it's software uh, so far uh, because I also think that Chrome is applicable in all in other fields, and I have something in mind. But still, I didn't have the opportunity to try the agile approach in the different areas except the software. So I can talk only about software and Scrum and how it works. So this, like, just simply in case someone is not aware, uh, basically the main topic. In Scrum is that we have uh, three different roles. I mean, the roles, uh, the, the more important roles, which uh, the most important one, in my opinion, is the product owner. It's uh, the product owner, actually, is the business person who understands the project and uh, who is uh, like uh, interacting, like a connection between the dev team, the guy that actually are developing the software, the product, and the business. So. If the dev team has some questions, if the dev team needs some prioritization, he's the guy. Then, yeah. The other role, Scrum Master, or also known in some companies as Project Manager. Uh, in my opinion, there are some difference between both roles, but uh, in some companies, it's one and the same. It might be one of the developers, it might be a dedicated uh, old school Project Manager, as I am. <laughs> And uh, it might be some of the QAs in mature teams. It might be uh, this Scrum Master. Every sprint, it might be like some of the QA. The next sprint, it might become some of the front-end team. Uh, yeah, so that's the guy that actually is uh, responsible for facilitating the team to uh, responsible also for um, improving the process, to answering the some questions that the team has in regards to the Scrum approach, um, and uh, yeah, to elaborate on, uh, to remove blockers, and to be resp uh, available on a daily basis to facilitate the process and uh, help the team in order to improve their performance. So, actually, it has some responsibility <laughs> from time to time. It doesn't have, but actually, this is like the most tricky role in the entire uh, Scrum. So, dev team, 
in the dev team. Uh, we have uh, uh, developers, uh, front-end, back-end, and uh, of course QA. So this team, it's all, uh, we also might have uh, designers. So in the dev team, we have all the people that are working, actually, that are developing the software itself. And here we go. We have also uh, internal stakeholders, the people that are funding the project, and external stakeholders. For instance, uh, that might be like uh, the end users, the, some of the, the guys that are going to use the product. Or external, external stakeholders might be, for instance, the, for instance, the hosting company. Because from time to time, like, even if you have the greatest product with the hosting company, uh, it's not delivering the support needed. Uh, you're going to fail, and you cannot do a lot of things here. So, um, yeah, so as you see, the product owner, it has the vision. It, it, he knows how the solution should look, look, uh, look at the end. Very quickly, how it works. All the requirements are provided by the product, product owner, who knows everything about the solution and they're captured in a product backlog. In the product backlog, they're listed and prioritized, like the most important requirement goes at the very top in this product backlog. Then, together with the Scrum Master, together uh, the team with the Scrum Master, they do uh, the sprint plan. This team knows their capacity, they know how much they can deliver in a specific amount of period, which is the sprint. Every sprint, should have one and the same duration. Usually it's from two to four weeks. In our company, FSW, we are using three week sprint. We try to two week sprint. It seems to be like too extensive because at the beginning, the first week more or less it's spent in, um, I mean, at least one of the days spent of it in planning. And then if you can demo at the very, at the end of the second week, so you're getting, you're, you're receiving something like, what, eight days of development and you cannot do a lot of things. But actually, if now I have to step in and uh, go with uh, a suggestion for sprint duration, I will vote also for two weeks, because you can deliver quite often, and you can receive quite often a feedback from the client, and actually uh, adjust better and be better focused on what you're working on and what you're delivering on. So you're basically, you're going to have uh, more deliveries uh, and uh, more frequently if you go with a small uh, duration of the sprint. All right, but in any case, let's assume that we are having three weeks sprint. So these guys perfectly know, should perfectly know what they can deliver in three weeks sprint. And based on the prioritization given, they do the sprint plan. Uh, right, and they start circling. Uh, and this circling means that uh, Every day, these guys are having their ceremonies, which are the daily stand-ups. They meet at the beginning, they talk what they're going to do this day, what they did yesterday, if they have some blockers, the Scrum Master is acting in order to uh, remove blockers, uh, answer some questions, get the feedback from the product owner, and this is happening every day, the daily Scrum. Then, um, at the very end of the sprint, they have a demo, and they have this potentially shippable incremental product. And they do the demo in front of the product owner, who is capable to provide the feedback right away. And uh, here we go. Then we, this team, they have uh, the retrospective. And uh, on this retrospective, actually the demo is here, screen review. And on the retrospective, they talk together with everyone involved in the process, what went good what doesn't uh, go so good and what can be improved. So the idea here is that they have the inspect and adapt process in place. Sorry, goes. Yeah. They have the explore, inspect, adapt, and they have their lessons learned. Which uh, the idea is that those, uh, those mistakes, uh, if, if any, won't be repeated next time. And they have the incremental delivery. And every sprint, they're building, let's say, one of those bricks, and at the end, they have the whole building delivered. So this is like in theory. And yeah, obviously, if the Scrum Master wants to have some kind of planning, 
he or she can prepare something like a master project plan, which we are going to see how it looks like. <coughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. Now I'm going to talk about some lessons learned, some practical things that are not like something that is happening in my real world. So how the project works? Uh, then, yeah, at the beginning we have, uh, we are receiving some initial client requirements, which are very high level. Then we do the discovery. The discovery is uh, something like uh, it might vary, but at the end, uh, the idea is to be able to say yeah, how much it is going to cost. And basically on this decision, uh, yeah, the client can judge uh, and take the decision if he or she is capable to fund the project. So let's assume that uh, the answer is yes. Then we go with uh, a solution architecture. Uh, we provide the solution architecture. And based on this solution architecture, we do um, uh, a discovery. And Actually, it's, they're not connected, but like a second step, uh, we do survey and uh, another project uh, discovery with the project, project backlog preparation. Um, so here is the place where most of the user stories are collected uh, and uh, gathered by the product owner. If uh, he or she is not providing uh, those user stories. In the real world, this is not, at least I've seen that one just once. And uh, this not happen quite often. So you should go there to the client, start asking questions, do some surveys, prepare your homework, and you can be in a situation like, like that. So after these uh, surveys and uh, the preparation of the backlog is ready, um, we are doing resourcing, team setup, and project schedule. More or less, uh, based on the complexity of the project, we can estimate how much time it is going to take us in order to deliver the project, and actually what kind of people we need to involve in, the, in our project in order to be, uh, yeah, to be capable to deliver the solution, and how much time, obviously, it is going to take. Yes, so, then the Scrum Master or the project manager uh, step in and even, even for Scrum projects we have scope, <laughs> obviously we uh, the client is paying, we have budget and obviously the client is expecting something to happen on a certain day or at least he or she is asking questions when I'm going to receive the product. Then the Scrum Master has some difficulties because uh, should we should start asking questions what about the quality then how we should implement the scrum uh, what uh, the, the top management is start asking questions about the revenue if uh, the resources allocated are spending more time working on the project then uh, the team spirit might go down and all those like cons uh, constraints managed uh, by the Scrum Master or Project Manager uh, can bring uh, a lot of, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of pain, pains and uh, suffers. So, how we should avoid that one? Like an old school approach uh, was that one. And actually I tried to use that in some previous projects. So we have some sprints, <coughs> you do the master project one, then you assume that here you're going to have acceptance uh, phase and you bring the client at the, ver at the very end and then if the client is accepting everything, you have zero bugs, you go go live and you do the support afterwards. But unfortunately this is not working because here on this phase the client is saying yeah but I am not expecting that one you are not able to meet the, the, the go wife and obviously you're not able to do <laughs> the next steps. So this one is not scrum. <coughs> it's, it's not working that way and can bring a lot of problems for you. Yes, so how, uh, what are the tips actually? My tips, so at least what I have seen so far. Um, we, you, and we should definitely go with uh, the sprint zero. In the sprint zero, 
you should explain to the client and convince him that uh, you're not going to do some uh, active developments and you need to spend some time in order to be better prepared. So in Sprint Zero, we do the backlog preparation and we capture user stories. Um, so the same thing, we are drawing architecture, we are talking with uh, the business owners about uh, their needs, about what they're expecting at the end. Obviously, the product owner is not providing a ready backlog, so more or less, this is like how uh, things should look like. But actually, like, this is like a situation known as user story blindness. So you're spending so much time talking to the client and trying to figure out what, what are the user stories and if, if the, because we're talking about LSDs, so if the project is really complex, you might be lost. And <laughs> I have lived this one, uh, at least once. So thinking about, did I capture this user story or how this one is different? And if you have like a thousand user stories, definitely at some point you should figure out a way how to capture those in a most appropriate manner. So, like a recommendation is that if you try capturing user stories, figure out your own way of, way of labeling those user stories. Like you, you might divide those by different system components. You might divide them in epics, um, and, or you might start drawing in a huge paper, like uh, the different user stories, like a setup of those user stories that are related to this component, a setup of those user stories related to this component, or like also adding the user stories to the uh, architecture that uh, the technical team provided to you. So you definitely should try even at the very beginning, start thinking on the best way, how um, in a best structural way, how this uh, approach should work for you in order to avoid situations like those. Because for big projects, this is like what, what is happening. All right, uh, so in Sprint Zero, something really important and maybe <laughs> answering uh, some of the questions. Um, yeah, which was uh, this one. How to integrate a client into the Sprint project? So, you should discuss with the, with the client the process and uh, what is the client's responsibility. Uh, flow of, uh, the, of Jira for a user story for one of the projects that uh, I worked on. Um, so the blue one, actually, those are uh, responsibilities of the client. So those steps over there, like a ticket is created, then it goes to this, the discovery. In the discovery, it's like a high-level description of, of the ticket. You can imagine something like, as an uh, administrator, I want to be able to uh, assign different roles to users. Then, like, this is the discovery, and this is like the general description of the ticket. Then it is marked as ready for acceptance criteria, and this is supposed to be done by the client. Then, once it's, done, it's uh, marked as ready for acceptance criteria, it goes to a uh, user story review. Uh, in this case here, the product owner is uh, adding the acceptance criteria, because the product owner owns the acceptance criteria. And here, the acceptance criteria should be an extension to the uh, user story general description. So we should, in this case that I gave, uh, it should be something like, um, it, it might be many different things, but it, it also might be something like, uh, I expect that I have an interface, I go to, um, a, I go to a view where I can see different uh, users, I find the user, I go to the specific user, and I assign by checkbox uh, different roles. I click save, and the roles are granted to this specific user. So this is like a description, uh, an extension of uh, the description, and uh, it's an acceptance criteria that it's really important for the Scrum project because this is like the guidance that the QA guys and all the team is going to follow in order to deliver the specific user story. Then. Um, it goes to once uh, the acceptance criteria is provided, it is marked as uh, ready for the development. And here, like, uh, there is the phase where the Scrum Master or someone from uh, the team is uh, checking the acceptance criteria, is reading, uh, reading the user story. So for this specific project, it was mainly me, because the team was really busy with, uh, other, with 
their uh, tickets and we really were running out of time. So um, I was checking <coughs> the acceptance criteria and if uh, the acceptance criteria is not good enough, then it is a return back uh, so the client should elaborate more and provide an ex uh, acceptance criteria that is re reliable and that it's uh, <coughs> uh, meaningful. So like this is the first phase of involving the client. Then obviously it goes uh, once the acceptance criteria is amazing, it goes to uh, the ready for dev state and uh, if the ticket is prioritized and it goes to some of the sprints, it goes to development, uh, teaming, ready for QA and so on. I don't know if all that uh, you're using I guess for your projects. Then once we consider that everything is great with this ticket and we have zero bugs and we have uh, covered the acceptance criteria, uh, we do user acceptance tests, tests for every single ticket. And as I showed in the old school way, we are not waiting at the end of the project to involve the client, but we are throwing, let's say, throwing to the client every single ticket that it's in state uh, ready for UAT. So here is the second iteration with the client before the, the demo, because the client can go uh, read the ticket and uh, we have different uh, 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 links to uh, Zephyr test case. It's actually the Zephyr test case. It's a written uh, test case that it's explaining to the client, or not only to the client, but actually prepared by the QA that is explaining uh, how manually the QA had uh, tested a specific user story and it is more or less like a guide. So following this structure, the client can definitely go and check uh, if everything is good with the ticket. And of course, if, if it's not or if he has some questions, objections, whatever, he might fail the UAP ticket. Then we need to react immediately. And uh, yeah. Actually, our goal was uh, to have uh, uh, verified by the client all tickets that we have in our sprint. So far, uh, for 11 sprints, I, I never seen this one happening for all of the tickets because like it's too extensive. Uh, some of the tickets might be assigned uh, two days before uh, the deadline, the, the sprint demo, the end of the sprint. The client might fail some of the tickets. We might not have the time needed to close all of the bugs and so on. So like, yeah, that, that's the second involvement of the client. All right, um, yeah, so here's just uh, an example, a really good one that I found in the net, how you can structure uh, the user stories in order to avoid uh, the user story blindness. Uh, I guess that this, for most of you should be, uh, you, you should be aware of that one. But actually, just quickly, um, you can uh, specify a team. Um, then you should, you might uh, break down the team into epics. For instance, epics might be all content types. Or epics might be, for, uh, if you have a commerce site, uh, the, the payment uh, flow. And then from these epics, you might uh, divide, uh, break down the epic into user stories and then into specific tasks. So this is something that works for me, uh, but uh, I'm using from epic user stories and tasks. I so far skipped the theme part because maybe I didn't, we didn't have so big projects. Also, uh, then a second question might be how we are, um, how we are keeping track on the user stories uh, collected. So you don't need to have like some fancy tools as uh, as Jira, Podio, or something that uh, you need to spend a lot of money. You simply might have uh, Excel or Google Sheet. Google Sheet is really great because you can uh, like real time. Uh, keep editing the user stories and see what the other guys are uh, working on and co collaborating. Um, and here's some example. You can automate a lot of things in uh, Google Spreadsheet as well and Excel and have like a real-time way of editing user stories. Um, of course, you might have uh, Jira. So here's one example of Jira. You see the different screens over there. Uh, also, you see the story points given here. It, it has nice interface, but it 
So that makes sense. All right. So here's one example of a user story captured in uh, Jira. So you see the description, the high level description of the specific ticket. Then you see the acceptance with the criteria. Uh, like you see that uh, this acceptance criteria is more extensive, provides much more details, and it works as a guidance to all of the team members in order to be sure what they should uh, deliver in the end. And yeah, actually, you see the status there. It's a really good tool, and this is what we are using for our <coughs> users. And of course, do not forget, acceptance criteria is product owner's duty. Um, but for most of the projects, uh, once again, I see also for some other Scrum projects, the product owner is not providing the acceptance criteria. So you need to push as much as possible this guy to start working on the acceptance criteria. Because I have lived this situation, like we are de delivering um, a user story and the product owner is saying, yeah, but this is not what I was expecting for. And then you simply can reply, yeah, but that's in the acceptance criteria. <laughs> and then if you have uh, the other answer, yeah, but actually you wrote the acceptance criteria, I approve it, but actually I didn't pay attention what is written there, then you have like uh, an entry. And obviously something in the process is broken. Um, yeah. So, again, Agile Scrum does not mean no planning. Uh, you still have your sprints and you can plan in a head what is going to be delivered at the end of the project. But this is an uh, insane thing. Like this, my, some of my previous uh, Microsoft project, detailed project one. Think that I was spending uh, hours uh, to update every week because I was very keen in tracking every specific activity here. Um, you see that we have deadlines for everything, but uh, this is like waste because uh, in software development you're spending a lot of time of <laughs> planning something that is not happening. It's really dynamic, uh, and you simply cannot predict what can go wrong. So this is definitely a waste. At least for me. Maybe for some of you it's going to be working perfectly. <coughs> Uh, yeah, and uh, instead of spending so much troubles and time in uh, these uh, plans, you simply might have some of those. Like, this all you need. You, you should know when the sprint ends, what activities are more or less <coughs> going to, to start from week, whatever it is, and uh, when the project ends. That's all. <coughs> Yes, and uh, in terms of planning, then you should uh, again uh, try to plan how many story points you're going to be capable to deliver in one sprint. Then we go with the team capacity planning, because on uh, every three weeks we need to do our plannings. Um, so at the beginning of the sprint, once you're dealing with uh, the sprint planning, the team is going to uh, get back to you saying, okay, how many story points we are going to commit to? And um, yeah, what is our capacity? And like most, in, in most of the cases, those questions are going to remain open or uh, it is going to be a wild guess, just saying a number. I believe that we are going to be able to deliver this amount, but why you believe so? Yeah, this is my personal uh, commitment. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, did you did you take into account that we are we have a lot of meetings, we have uh, catch-ups every day with the client, or we do something else? Uh, we need to work on uh, something, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so we don't believe in these story points that we are going to be able to deliver. Then obviously you need to provide some answers and uh, also have a clear picture and to, yeah, to be on the same page with the team and. Uh, you, instead of, again, spending a lot of time estimating and trying to uh, make the things uh, more complex, uh, they are complex, but you can spend a lot of time make, 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 make them even more complex, you might go with something like this. Like, 
team leader, the develop, developer that is senior, uh, you are calculating how many persons are in the team, days in the sprint, this is uh, for two weeks sprint, yes, and I have calculated that these guys are going to spend some time in meetings, and these sometimes when I'm deducting and also in sprint planning, in sprint demo, in the retrospective, and when I'm reducing this time from the 10 working days, I'm getting these numbers. And here some of the guys, he had a day off or something. So then uh, on a historical basis, uh, we are adding uh, the expected story points to be delivered by a team member on a daily basis. You do the simple maths and you have like more or less the number that you're going to put on the table. Um, what's, what's the commitment of the team to this number? Yeah, a good question. <laughs> so you're putting on the table this, that one, and of course you might just by saying, all right guys, let's uh, discuss how many uh, user stories uh, and what total amount of uh, story points we can deliver in this print, because I believe that based on the historical data, based on your capacity, we're going to be able to, to deliver that one. And uh, it might be a situation, I, I have lived both scenarios, like, in some situation, the team might say, yeah, let's, let's deliver even more, let's increase with 20%. And, but when you have like a communication, might be uh, a situation where the team is not committed on this uh, number because of some previous historical data. Like they can come to you and say, you remember last sprint, we estimate, our estimate wasn't accurate and we need to revise the story points given for the, story, for, for the user stories. Then obviously you should listen to these guys because they should be, uh, they should believe in the story points given and committed. And then you obviously should have the fight with the product owner because the product owner is pushing uh, to deliver more user stories. But again, if you have your arguments, if the team is capable to provide the, the arguments that you need in order to face the product owner, you're going to be uh, more or less on the safe side. <coughs> but I mean, with, with that one, at least you have an argument. Why you believe in 20, in 94 story points? All right. Um, then, uh, yes. I really like the question, how we are going with uh, so far? Uh, are we delayed or we are on time? So, yes, I'm using this one. It's a Google Sheet again. It's a template uh, that I use. Uh, and I, I worked with. Um, as I said, uh, we are using Jira, but unfortunately in Jira, in order to, to burn and actually to close uh, the story points in the burn down chart, you need to complete, to close the ticket itself, the parent ticket. But as you, you, you have seen before in our flow, uh, the ticket is only closed once it goes through UAT. And uh, if the client uh, does have limited uh, resources doing UAT, then you might have troubles. Then, like the burn down chart, it's going to be something like this, and like if that's the very end day, something like that, which is not, not good enough. So, that's why I, I kind of invented this one. From time to time, it sounds uh, as a waste for me, but at least is, 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 given, is giving uh, the, the the information that I need on a daily basis about the progress. So how I collect that one? Uh, I'm listing all the user stories that we have in the current sprint, and then I'm checking how much time the team is working on them. I'm, if I have some questions about their progress on a daily basis, I'm talking to, to, to the guy saying, all right, you spent six hours on this user stories, user story, but uh, how many hours? Or, what is actually your progress today in terms of story points. And then you're just simply updating the numbers on daily basis and you get uh, the data. <coughs> so yeah, actually that one is providing the information. Uh, I mean, the blue line, it's uh, the guide line. So actually this is, the, this is taking into consideration the assumption that every day the team is uh, burning specific amount of uh, equal amount of story points and the red line actually it's uh, the story points uh, delivered by the team so here that means that we didn't deliver 23.9 story points 
which is in percentage uh, more than 10%, something like 15%, which happens. All right, so, oops, oops, oops. Yeah, uh, the other question is, uh, what is going to be delivered at the very end? So again, here you can uh, have uh, an overview or at least uh, be prepared. And uh, if you see that these guys, I mean, the team is not delivering uh, the story points. Uh, I mean, this one I have uh, prepared at the beginning of, of the project, yes. So if you see that uh, we are not able to deliver the story points uh, allocated uh, for the next prints, uh, then we are definitely in trouble because we are not going to be able to deliver all the users the user stories estimated so far and at least once you see this one happening you should go to the client immediately and yeah, yeah two, two short questions how hard was that team on that project and story points were like uh, um, city yes. days or yes all right about uh, what means story points right and convert it and yes well, uh, some of the Scrum teams in, in our company, they're having like a real mapping. One hour, one story point. Another teams, I know that they do with uh, days. But something that uh, at least we have, uh, we have uh, implemented, it's uh, more or less conversion, one story point uh, equals to three, four hours. I mean, it's not fixed, but more or less uh, you convert that one in your head. What about using relative values, comparing different user stories and giving the story point based on that, not using the absolute yes. like time. Yeah, absolutely. That's also another approach. Saying uh, another approach it might be what is uh, the most complex task uh, for you and how many story points it might be given. Then let's say 10, 12. And what is the most uh, easy task that you're going to handle? And this one is uh, 0 uh, 0.5. But then the question goes uh, with uh, the client. Uh, because uh, some clients, they really want to see hours. And in order to be able to complete that, that one and to see hours in advance. I mean, what is going to be uh, invoiced to us in, uh, or how this project looks look like in terms of hours? Then if you say, all right, uh, you know, the team is going to work nice prints and we are going to have uh, uh, because these guys are full, full time dedicated, we have this amount of hours. Uh, then they have, on the other hand, uh, the user stories estimated in story points. They're going to ask the other question. Yeah, but are you going to be able to deliver those story points? And what, what are the hour uh, rate uh, for these story points? Then obviously you're forced to do this kind of, uh, of mapping. Yes, and also in terms of the complexity, I just posted that estimate the entire cloud backlog in, in, in advance before pulling something into the user. How can you determine what is a complexity of an individual story point unless you have the entire picture as far as estimates? Like a rolling wave approach, you don't know at the beginning all the details about every user story. You will know when you get to that user story or that sprint when you are delivering that user story. Absolutely true. That, so that's that's all pretty much relevant. Yes, absolutely true. And like, we also have seen that one story that we have estimated at the beginning during the spring zero <coughs> as whatever, five, then when you're approaching, you're laughing and you're saying, but this is not five, this is like <coughs> 10, or this is like an epic, we should yeah, yeah, break it down. But the reason why we are doing that one, it's once again, like we need somehow to justify uh, the, the project complexity and the client, like if you're living in the client shoes, so maybe you're going to do the same thing, like trying to push the, the guy on the other side to, to say how complex this project is at the very beginning and this, how you're going to know if you have the money to pay for. But, but totally. Time agree. doesn't think of quality or the complexity. You can spend hours developing something, not deliver anything, or some other people spend two or three hours and deliver something great. So time is not a real measurement. And clients need to understand it. I know that you know this, but yeah. you but need to teach them this kind of prices. <laughs> time, <laughs> and time is money. So price equals the quality of the product. Yeah. yeah. And your 
or complexity right. it's like the uh, top senior developer is priced depending on the real location yeah or are differently than the junior yeah. yeah and that's why we have the different expectation for uh, junior developers uh, to be able to burn story points per day exactly. as on the table yeah and your story points are <laughs> here like three two three hours on that chart uh on that chart uh yes right. okay so obviously uh you can do some uh you can convert uh, the previous table into a team velocity chart and see how you're going and based on this chart you can elaborate actually uh, figure out the trend and try to find out uh, what went wrong like here you have significant drop in uh, the third points delivered so maybe something uh, very bad happened and again you should step in do you take into account ahead of time, vacations, holidays, sick leaves? Yes. Because they affect the velocity. You're laughing, but wait. We are not laughing. We just want the velocity of this print because of the velocity. You see the blue one? Here we go. It's, it's not calculated. And do you track uh, Scrum books itself? Uh, how much time do you spend planning the review, inspections, and all the stuff? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, why should you? Why should you? Because there are needs. Yes, yes. in this one. But in terms of capacity, resolving tasks, and all that. But, but you, you, you don't know the ratio between uh, team mobility and velocity. Yes. Mobility, how much is important, and velocity, how much they can really develop. Yeah. Yes, for example, I, I can tell you, like, <laughs> this one, what I, have ca what I <coughs> have calculated, it's like half of the day, half of the day we spent in sprint planning, half of the day we spent in uh, uh, retro and demo, and then we have one fourth of the day spent in daily standards, and that's why I get 8.75. Uh, and, like, this is the time that we expect the developer is sitting and working on the tasks, because if he or she goes to, to a meeting, that's not doable. All right. Uh, where? Okay. Agile doesn't, doesn't mean no quality. Uh, yeah. I said that we have a secure plugin and we have something that is open source. It's really good for writing um, test cases, manual test cases like those. It's a test link. You can post it yourself, and it's absolutely free. You can also grant an access to the client to this uh, tool, so the client goes there, finds the specific ticket, reads uh, how he or she can test what is the expected result, and uh, have really cool transparency. And actually, to this one, you can reference a Jira ticket, so it's really cool. And it can be exported as well. Yes, it can be exported. Yeah, in different formats, you can send a report. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and talking about quality, why our project fails? So, yeah, guys, what do you think? Really? I mean, the first thing that comes in your mind. Expectations management. Right. They expect to have a, well, a spaceship and you're giving them a car. Yeah. No feedback. No feedback, yes. All right, uh, something that I figure out, this is the technical yeah. depth. Like, that's uh, <laughs> and more or less, uh, e even that we know that this is going to happen, we are committing one and the same errors every time. And this is fact and adapt definitely, uh, at least in my opinion, something for myself. I should start uh, doing better inspect and adapt process about the technical depth. Thing that we know that, yeah, but we are running out of time, we don't have time. Next print, you're going to do this one. You're going to clean the technical debt. But it, it never happens. So at the end of the project, the car breaks and no one is happy. So this is like how te technical debt works. Uh, yeah. 
instead of uh, spending some time delivering less uh, user stories at the beginning and after that having uh, the trend growing up, you are constantly dealing with stuff that you don't like, you know that this is not the right thing and it hits you at a very uh, inappropriate moment, but it never hits you, every time. And something that uh, another lesson word is the automated test. So for large scale Drupal projects, definitely automated scripts is a must. Uh, having QA that is uh, explaining to you that uh, the automated tests are going to be delivered at the end of the project simply doesn't work. So they have to be built every single sprint, like constantly. And you should spend, if these guys are not committed to do this job, you should spend all the time needed, all the effort needed in order to convince them, to explain them how important those automated tests are. Because like, if you don't have automated tests, obviously you're going to suffer uh, for lack of time at the end of the project. Then something pops up and you don't know why, and in order to retest everything, you should spend like one hour to go through all the system and figure out when, where exactly this functionality is broken. Do you have testers in your team? Sorry? Do you have testers in your team? Yes. <laughs> the thing is that if they are, uh, I don't say afraid, but if for some reason they have many things to do and they don't have time to write the appropriate automated tests, uh, even that something works today, it won't be working in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So without automated tests, you, the client is going to come to you saying, this one is broken. And it's not the, the other way around. Uh, yes, uh, the final thing, the team. So in, uh, in complex projects, in projects that you, you're running out of time, the, dead, the, the, the deadline is tough, and you have to deliver a lot of things, and you have to force uh, and push yourself. This one, it's, it's really tricky. And you should be, uh, you should find a way how to talk with, to, to the team, how to discuss, uh, uh, as I said, for instance, uh, the automated tests, how to discuss those topics with the team without uh, pushing them too much uh, in, in order to be, uh, to keeping the empathy needed uh, in order to to work hard and everyone to be happy. Like, this is something like a uh, very difficult thing and uh, a psychology uh, effort that you, you should spend and you should never forget about this one. Because uh, if you are pushing too much a team, if you are becoming like a uh, an enemy, it is not going to uh, end up in a good shape. So, yeah. thank you. And yes, if you have, yeah, uh, you have questions. Uh, manage uh, big people, 50 people in the scrum team. Uh, so, it is really difficult. I mean, I don't know actually who exactly said. Yes. How many, how many people did you have? You said that the title was large scale. Yes. Uh, okay, at the moment we have uh, such a project, I believe. I consider it as a large scale, and we have around 50. And we have actually calculated that uh, the developers, they were something like 13. I mean, um, and we have like what? We have like three QAs, uh, 13 developers, uh, one, one front end, 70. And without the other stakeholders and all the guys, and we have like a team that is doing QAT, you have uh, another project managers uh, from the client side, so around 20, 25 people that you should like communicate with on a daily basis. And what style? Um, what style is that project? Commerce project. Yeah, do all commerce. Can you extend that? <laughs> with that amount of people? Yeah, how does it look like? Yes, and it is passing 15 minutes. <laughs> Even that you, from time to time, maybe you're, you're able to fit into the 15 minutes. Is it considered separate then? Multiple teams are doing Scrum as teams? Yes, but I mean, the thing is that they're really uh, uh, related, and uh, I mean, the development. And the the other, it, yes, and it will be very difficult to separate them. And, but maybe it's a good 
uh, approach for the next project because uh, at least I'm, I'm suffering. Um, actually, for uh, some of the activities that were possible to be separated, we separated them. So we had uh, what we had two developers, one QA, uh, and yeah, two developers, one QA separated from the other thing. But it, it's really difficult, and especially actually in our if I guess if you are like a team lead, I can see from our team lead because he's responsible to do code reviews and uh, to be on top on everything that is happening. That is very difficult. One, one little little of help. When you say front end, is it the team or front end or how do team or front end? Yes. And he does all the front end. <coughs> one on front end. Um, actually, there's another. Okay, there are some guys that are full stack developers that also do a kind of uh, basic uh, team. It, it depends on the project. Yeah, it if depends you have on the project. Without zero. <laughs> 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 actually, we are trying to reuse the existing thing. It's not like you have like. Yeah. I mean, like at least 15 people. If you have this situation this summer, and actually, it's 15 to the four things. Yes, it is distributed. One of the team is uh, in Sofia, the other one is in the UK, uh, and one is in Ukraine, actually. One person, just one. Uh, so it's over Skype. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and does it enjoy better the Scrum than. If there is someone in LA, that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A actually, there's a, now we are facing some, let's say, consultant uh, team that is responsible for. Only specific part of testing the system at the end, and there in uh, in the US actually I don't know in which specific city, but yeah, it is a problem. It is done <laughs> working overnight. You know how? Yeah. Or you compare the team spirit between the Scrum and the waterfall approach? Um. Well, in waterfall uh, approach. Uh, we are, we, at least I didn't spend so much time arguing. And not arguing, but uh, discussing things. Trying to convince the team that something is important. That uh, we didn't spend uh, so much time to reach the goal, and uh, they, the team it wasn't so much committed. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of team spirit, definitely, with Scrum, it, it is much better. Yeah, let's, okay. Can one team working in multiple? Uh, actually, this one it's very tricky, and uh, it looks like I have right that one, uh, and it's not working. Uh, it, it's very, it's very difficult. And I really believe that if you're working on a Scrum project and if you're a developer, you should be outside going to uh, one one project. Even even nowadays, our company is trying to do it, and I see that it's very difficult. 
maybe someone can share how they're doing and if uh, this is beneficial. Uh, it's a distraction. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you expect the junior developer to be working on more than one project? Uh, yeah, but it, it's like a simple task. It's just like maybe we, we, we do, do stuff like that. Right? So like a simple basic stuff, you know. So they can like, well, they, I mean, it's, it's the same thing if you, you think if you like, are creating a view or something. You can use a whole of the app or anything that, that's like... Do you have a choice? Do you have to make the work more? Yes. <laughs> From time to time, you see. <laughs> okay, okay, that's we, we have a uh, many, many, many yes. more clear yeah. coming in. Many more clear questions. Is Ford, even the projects are totally different? Uh, so actually, if the uh, team members are actually uh, on, on multiple projects, is it, is it a good idea to actually merge them all into one big team of 20 people? Um, yeah, but uh, what about the disruption? Uh, if there are different uh, projects, uh, even like one team is having standard work at 9 o'clock, the other is having at 9.30, they are discussing something. That's make, but obviously, well, like one disadvantage might be the disruption, another advantage might be sharing knowledge, say. Yeah, by listening you can learn a lot of things. If you can do it. Yeah, if you can do both. <laughs> Alright, cool. Thank you then guys. Yeah, thank you.